Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel and today I've got a special guest, it's Alex Bolosa and Alex is an old friend of mine, somebody I've met at Polyglot events over the years and he's a language learner I hugely admire. He set himself the goal to get fluent in 10 languages. Uh, but Alex, as I understand it, you come from a very monoglot Russian-speaking background in eastern Ukraine. Is that right? And how did you get into languages? Hi, Gareth. It's, it's great to be on, on, on the project. Great to be here. And kudos for pronouncing my last name right. Uh, to begin with, yes, I was born and grew up in, uh, in the east of Ukraine. Uh, Many Ukrainians, most Ukrainians are actually bilinguals, right? So they understand at least Ukrainian and Russian. But in my case, it was pretty monolingual at that time. Everybody was speaking Russian, only Russian around. I think I first felt interest in foreign languages when I was 12, when my parents hired a tutor for me, because I was not, I was by no means a talented genius or whatever. I was actually lagging behind the school program because I got sick a lot and I missed school and then I came back to school and then I could not keep up with the school program in English. And that program, mind you, was super basic. So I wasn't even okay with that. But uh, my parents got me a tutor and that guy was just the most charismatic teacher you would ever meet. And uh, I'm really grateful to that person for the influence that that person had in my life. He was 26, super young university professor. And um, yeah, so he, it was super contagious, his charisma and his passion uh, got me started on, on, on English. So English was my first foreign language. And um, then I would uh, go to the Lyceum of Foreign Language. That was a specialized school where we would have 10 classes of English a week. And another special thing we did was participate in Olympiads. Sounds super professional. Uh, this is something that all Eastern Europeans would know. They have it all over the former European um, Soviet Union, I'm sorry. Uh, competitions for school uh, children in different subjects. So what we would do, we would participate in uh, English contests on regional level and then ultimately on all Ukrainian level. So this was uh, this was how I got to spend so many hours, so much time learning English. So when everybody went to bed, I would stay awake and write essays in English, like at 1 p.m., 2 p.m. at night. So this was my world, you know. So uh, that was that was in the Lyceum. That was age what eleven? It's like high school, really, from age eleven right. through to eighteen. Right. Sort of that started at twelve, and yeah. it went on until seventeen. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Those yeah. years. And the tutor you had, that was when you were even younger than 11, but you said he was charismatic. But what was it? Uh, was there anything specific about him or his advice which really helped you to get into English, even at that young age? That is oh, yeah. still relevant to you today as a language learner. Absolutely. So the first thing he did, I think I was 10 when I first met him. I was just really a kid. And he said, no Russian. We're going to speak English only. And I didn't even know the word understand. So he was trying to tell me, if you don't understand something, tell me, I do not understand you. And then I will repeat. And he tried to explain me that point in English. So he was super strict about not using any other language except for English. It was so hard. It was so frustrating. I was on the verge of crying so many times, but he was just really charismatic as a person. You know, he was just very artistic. And he would gesticulate and point and play and, and play and act. So it was really like, wow, you're so cool. I want to be like you. I want to, I don't know. I want to be like you, you know, that, that relationship. And that kept me going. And then after a couple of months, I caught up after a month, I would, I would caught, catch up with the program. A couple of months later, it was the best one in class. And then we kept working and then we were sort of, far away from anybody else, from my peers. But yeah, like, uh, I think the, the best thing he did for me was transmit that, that energy, that, that playful attitude that, wow, it's like, it's amazing. You can do things with the language you can, because imagine it was post Soviet Ukraine. It was so depressing. Everybody was poor criminality around gray, dirty. And then you have your own world, you know, that magic place that, 
it was before Facebook, before computers even, with very few materials available. You had maybe that book from America, like, wow, that, that beautiful world is somewhere. You want to be part of that. You create your own, like, fantasy world. I think this is, I think this is the feeling that uh, I still have up to now, in a way. And that carried you then with English at high school, but eventually you went to Kiev to study interpreting with German, uh, Ukrainian, I think. Now, so had you improved or got into German then as well at high school? And what about Ukrainian? Um, first so that's thing, two questions at once. Sorry. <laughs> first thing first, uh, German was my second language at, at that Lyceum. Yeah. But it was always like uh, somewhere, somewhere on the side because we spent so much time with English. We were not very lucky uh, with German teachers. I hope they don't see that. Uh, but German is just generally harder. It's it's very dry if you talk about grammar. It was a grammar standard approach with a lot of grammar, no real connection to the culture, so it didn't work well. With English, it went amazing. Uh, so I was really lucky because I got won that Olympiad in the last grade. And um, there is a rule if you win that, that contest in the last grade on all Ukrainian level, you can go and study at any university in the country for free, which was a huge deal because nobody had money. Because if you were not eligible for a free place, your parents would have to pay a lot of money that my parents didn't have. So it was like my chance. And then I could choose basically any university in the country any, I could study anything provided the entrance exam was English. So I thought my English was really good by that time, at least for, for Ukrainian standards. So basically I knew I might really speak better than some Ukrainian university professors. This is like sad reality. So I thought it makes no sense to go and spend five more years with English. So what would be the next best pick? German, because I did have it for seven years at school, and my German was probably a two. It was very bad. <laughs> so I thought, let's let's do German and see if I can use the time in five years at the university to get German to a decent level. Speaking of Ukrainian, Ukrainian was a subject at school. My school at that time was in Russian, so we had all subjects in Russian. Unfortunately, this is very sad, but most people were not really passionate about Ukrainian at school because people did not feel connection with the language, unfortunately, and this caused many problems later on, but this is not the topic. But what is interesting, what is really interesting that I moved from the province, I went to the capital to study in Kiev and everything was in Ukrainian. It was the same country, but it was a totally different world. And if you think about it, I came there to study translation interpreting. So I was supposed to translate and interpret from German into Ukrainian. So here's the thing. The first class, the first translation class, I'm 17 years old. I just came to Kiev in September. We're having the first class and we're translating a super easy text from German to Ukrainian. And it has the word Deutschland in it, which is Germany. And I do not even know how to say Germany in Ukrainian. So it was such a shame because I was the only person in the whole course who went to Russian speaking school. So the first year when everybody was working on their German, I spent hundreds of hours practicing and trying to improve my Ukrainian just to be to be able to survive. This was a this is an unforgettable experience. And do you feel a warmth now towards the Ukrainian language which you said wasn't present in society in the East where you grew up, personally? Absolutely. I'm extremely happy that I mastered Ukrainian. It took time, as I told you, a lot of work I had to invest. I do not regret any of that. I'm so happy to be able to speak Ukrainian fluently. Uh, it all paid off. Now I love Western Ukraine. I love places like Lviv right uh, Lembach in German I can go there and can speak Ukrainian and I get accepted all the time and they get compliments people tell me wow your Ukrainian sounds so good and it's just so heartwarming uh, so definitely it was worth it it was really really rough so maybe if I could 
uh, during back the time, I could probably start earlier. Well, I don't know, but it was definitely, definitely worth it. And, and you then continued, continued your interpreting studies in Germany itself, did you? I got a scholarship, right, uh, to uh, go and get another master degree in Germany. My course was called Sprache Kultur Translation, which is language culture translation. So it is not it was not interpreting, it was written translation, and there were certain linguistics and cultural aspects. Uh, that was another very interesting experience, just uh, being 21, coming from Eastern Europe to, to Germany. Uh, there is a, quite a culture shock, actually. And um, I came to Germany, and even before I came to study, I uh, took a C2 German exam, and I passed it with the highest grade, which means officially my German was extremely good. But practically, just being in a new country, in the province where people speak a dialect, it was quite a challenge. So it took me a long time to adjust, to be accepted in a new culture. So this was really hard. I just want to maybe make a point that if you do it the first time, it is extremely hard. And many people come to a new country, millions of people nowadays move between countries looking for a living, for a better life, and they come without a language. So I can only try to imagine how hard that can be. And I came with sort of C2, and I suffered a lot to be accepted with my C2 German. So Where very... were you? Which province were you in, in Germany? It was uh, Rheinland-Pfalz, yeah. uh, close to Baden-Württemberg, on a border, a very provincial place. Uh, we belonged to Uni Mainz, University Mainz, but the linguistic faculty, translation interpreting faculty was 120 kilometers away in a very small place with 12 or 18,000 inhabitants. So just nothing going on, just 2,500 people from all over the world who came to study languages. It's a very special place. And after you finished that second uh, degree, did you work as a translator then? When did you get into teaching as well? Many years later, unfortunately, I should have started earlier. Uh, for people who come from non-European Union countries, uh, the main goal is just to stay, to find a way to find a job, because if they don't find a job pretty soon after they uh, graduate, they have to go back home. So I had I accepted a job that um, was a project manager in a translation department. So it sort of had to do with languages, but not really. So German was enough and some English. Um, the, the thing with languages came, unfortunately, many years later, three years, three years before, three years ago. Um, the thing is that I was doing that job that I was not very happy about. Uh, so, but I, I was thinking what I want to do in life, how can I live that, that interest, that passion for languages, and I think I was 24 when I came up with the idea that I want to be a polyglot, I want to speak 10 languages. I had that idea for the first time, I think it was probably eight or nine years ago, and I started Googling, I Googled 10 languages, people who speak 10 languages, I wanted to know if there is anybody already who does that. Unfortunately, or I don't know, fortunately, I found some. Benny Lewis was already there, and maybe Steve Kaufman, Luca Lampariello, and Richard Simcott. So I think I found those four yeah, people at yeah. that point. So I was sort of sad because I wouldn't be the first one because I had those, you know, those ambitions. But then I very quickly I realized, wow, that's amazing. First of all, if those people exist, it means it's possible. If they could do it, maybe I have a chance. And they do videos. They're very generous in sharing advice. So maybe I can just learn from them and try to pick up as much as possible and like improve my own skills and strategies and philosophy. And this is what I did. And I learned a lot from those people, especially, I would say, from Steve Kaufman. And... Would that be the emphasis then that you put on comprehensible input and getting a lot of exposure through reading and reading and listening to a language as early as possible? 
100%. I think um, Steve Kaufman did a series probably 10 years ago, Seven Secrets of Successful Language Learning. And uh, I think few people know these videos, but they really impressed me. They really stuck with me at that time. And I thought, this actually, this is actually true. I've been doing that subconsciously myself even before that because I was playing around with learning Polish a bit, learning French a bit by myself. Uh, this was the time probably before Facebook. So many of the things were not available. But the idea of just getting exposure, learning, um, reading a lot, listening to a lot of stuff, uh, being motivated, to not try not to depend on others, just being an independent learner, right? I can, I believe that I can learn a language myself, and I don't need anybody to to guide me. This is every, this is these are the things he was talking about. And I thought, wow, that makes sense. I just need. I remember what helped me a lot was uh, listening because he spoke a lot about how important it is to listen. And I realized I'm not listening enough. And I had, had some trouble with understanding when I was listening languages and I realized, well, I just don't listen enough. I have to listen probably three times more. And I started doing that and probably in a month I already saw, wow, now is my strongest aspect. So it works. And uh, I just keep following that advice up to now, and uh, it's been working. It's been doing uh, one. I think that is one of the things that non-language nuts, if I can put it that way, don't realize that even the most talented language learners, they know they spend a lot more time with the language. Whatever different methods they use, they do just spend a whole lot more time reading, listening, practicing speaking than you would get, uh, you know, in the course of one's career at high school. I remember when I was learning French, we had two or three half hour lessons a week over five years uh, during term time. And that was it. Of course, we can't speak French at the end. If you add up those hours and it is the number of hours in the end, isn't it, that matters. Uh, it's just not enough for a start before you even start to talk about methods. Absolutely. And that's why it helps you if you get motivated, if you get passionate, then you just notice, don't notice those hours flying by and you get better as long as you, as you, as you were doing that, as you were being with the language, but you definitely need to make language a priority. You need to be conscious and deliberate about those things. And this makes a huge difference because now that I have so much experience, I know that I need to keep reading, to keep listening, to keep speaking, to take, to keep attacking or feeding my brain with new input, because that's the only way to learn. But um, if you're a school kid, right, you have many things to do, or adults have a lot of things going on in their lives. They have families, they have jobs. And it really is not enough. You should just do maybe two times a week, one hour. This is not how language acquisition works. And it's not about you being not talented. It's the same for most of us, for 99% of us, me included. It's just not possible. If you do it two times a week for one hour and then you don't find time during the week to listen, read, and be conscious about it, you're not going to grow. Now, when you're starting off, it's all right talking about, I just start listening, I just start reading. And, you know, granted, you're going to start with simplified materials for learners, perhaps, I don't know. Uh, but do, at the very beginning, the first weeks or the first months, I don't know, would you work with a textbook or just with dictionaries? Or how do the early stages look to you? And have those very early stages, the first few months, has that changed as you've gone through all these different languages over the last 10 years? Absolutely. Uh, it helps if you know a language, a couple of languages from the same language group. It makes things so much easier. If I were to learn Romanian now, it would be so much easier. I would just take a textbook and I would understand probably 60, 70 percent. But when I was starting Hebrew, a totally different language, it was a lot harder, a lot more challenging for many reasons. But yes, if it's a language which I can read, which uses probably Latin letters or Cyrillic letters, this is pretty straightforward because I can take a book and I can actually read the text from day one. So I would take those textbooks, I would find an audio, I would try to listen and read at the same time, the same content, content. so I would get audio information, visual information, right? 
at the same time. And I would try to leap through the book as fast as possible, picking up letters, picking up uh, new words, sorry. Because I think uh, it's really great to work with textbooks because they are built for you. They progressively introduce new vocabulary. And this is exactly what we need because we're not ready yet, right? Because we need that base. We need those two, three thousand words, at least a thousand words, right? And the books, uh, the textbooks are amazing for that because they build up on what was in the previous chapter. So use that, apply that. And this is what I would definitely do. Try to learn more words as soon as possible. And then when I feel I have that understanding, I have that vocabulary, I would try to go on YouTube. I would try to start with short videos, something super short, something super easy. Nowadays, it's so easy. You can activate automatic subtitles, right? Because most of the content that is appearing now has automatic subtitles. So do that. If you don't understand something, press pause, open a dictionary, Google Translate, and start working your way through. At the beginning, it's extremely hard, but it's normal. It's just the way it works, so just deal with it. If you're tired, go rest, do something else, and then come back. Start with sh super short videos. They're always funny videos, like three, four minutes subtitled. Um, sometimes there are subtitles in your language. You can use that too. So work, start working your way from the textbooks on to original content. And um, so you had this goal about 10 years ago now to do 10 languages. Some of those you'd already, so you'd already got Russian, Ukrainian, uh, German, and right. you have then built out from those three uh, how did your life look, though? Because you've done a lot of traveling, I know. Did you move countries each time to the, a country where the language was spoken? Which languages were they? Uh, and how did you pay for all this? Oh, yeah. So basically, as I told you, for many years, unfortunately, I had a super boring job, office job. So, but I already had that idea that I wanted to speak 10 languages fluently. So I would use all the time available in the office and at home, I would learn languages. I would pick, pick French, say, and I would spend three or four months with French, and I would probably get it to somewhere like B1. And then I would get bored or something would come up and I thought, okay, this is, this is, get, this is getting too hard. I don't know. I don't, I'm not patient enough. And I would pick up Spanish. I would spend four months with Spanish and then four months with Italian. So I got that base, right, in many European languages. So I had Russian and Ukrainian. Then I had English and German from university. So I had a professional level in those four. And all the rest I did by myself. So I did French, Spanish, Italian, Portuguese, and Polish. And I had those languages. I had it probably somewhere between B1 and B2. Um, in all of those languages. So when I changed my lifestyle, when I quit that work and I started traveling, I already had a solid base. So as you're right, I needed to work out how to earn money to be able to do those things. I, it was a hard time because, uh, of course, it's totally outside of your comfort zone, starting a new thing. You're super scared. So there is a lot of uh, unpleasant, uncomfortable thoughts. What do I do now? I'm at zero. I have no money. Will I have to go back to the office? I hate it so much. No way. So if you don't want to, then you need to find another thing. You need to really make that step, take that plunge. And I thought, well, what can I offer the world if my passion is languages? It has to be about languages because I've been doing that for almost 20 years, right? And I have two master degrees in languages. So I thought, I didn't like translating. Uh, translating is not for everybody. Translating, translation is, is boring because you spend eight hours a day or maybe more in front of your screen. You don't talk to anybody, just have a text. And you cannot pick a text that you want to translate because nobody pays you for translating exciting stuff. People pay you for translating stuff that people need for their businesses. So if you like law, if you like medicine, if you like technical stuff, right? If you like economics, then you're lucky. But if you don't, and you need to really, really understand those things, well, you might need a second degree. 
It's not that, oh, I know two languages really well, I can be a translator. No, it's a science and those people are extremely good and I respect, a good translator earns a lot of respect. But I realized I'm probably not that type of a guy. And for interpreting, which is another great activity, it's extremely stressful. You also need to be a special type of a person. Everybody speaks about simultaneous interpreting. People do at UNO you know, conferences, young conferences, yeah. but there is also consecutive. And it's not easy at all. Consecutive is also extremely stressful. This means this involves memorizing huge chunks of information and be, being able to reproduce them. So a speaker would be speaking for two minutes probably, and then he pauses and then you need to really <laughs> to translate everything he said. And there is you, probably you were standing on stage and you have hundreds and thousands of people looking at you. This is not for everybody. So coming back, I decided I should be teaching because um, I really can speak about languages for, for hours on end and without getting tired. I had a real pro professional knowledge of German. I could explain the rules. I could explain why things work in a certain way, which is a huge advantage as opposed to most native speakers. And um, I started uh, teaching online using platforms like italki. And um, luckily it worked out. I spent several months working at a school, at a real school in Germany in Stuttgart, gathering experience. But four months later, I had enough online students, so I quit, bought a ticket to Ecuador, and uh, went to South America to improve my Spanish. And then I spent uh, a year in South America working on my Spanish, got a C1 degree in Spanish, uh, came back to Europe, spent several months in Poland, improving my Polish, passed a Polish exam, uh, went to Brazil. I guess, spent four months in Brazil and took, took an exam in Brazilian Portuguese. And uh, a, month, a week ago, I was supposed to be in Rome doing a C1 in Polish, but unfortunately... In, in Italian or Polish in Rome? Uh, oh, it was crazy. I took a Brazilian Portuguese exam in South Korea. Ah, so, okay. You took the exams all over the place. Yeah, I'm taking exams all over the place, but you're definitely right. I go to a place to work on a language. So I spent, I visited almost all Spanish speaking countries in South America, except for Venezuela. I took that Spanish exam in uh, Guatemala and then Polish I did in Poland, um, Brazilian Portuguese I did in uh, South Korea, but I just could not stay, I could not overstay, Un unfortunately, in Brazil, so I had to work it out. Um, and then I spent two months in Italy uh, before, uh, before latest events, when it was quiet and beautiful, and um, that helped me a lot, that helped me improve my Italian. And hope to, to to be able to take that Italian exam in June. Once we're able to travel again. <laughs> yeah. And what about French? Have you done a French exam as well? Do French you... is coming. So basically the idea for this year would be to pass uh, an Italian and French C1 yeah. exams. Yeah. These are the ones left. And all the time you continue with your teaching business online. Do you, uh, you have your own website now, don't you? So... If people wanted to work with you, do you teach just German or some of the other languages? Or... I teach German currently. Yeah. I started out with Russian, German and English because Russian is my mother tongue. Yeah. And um, English I studied too professionally. But then I decided that English is not my native language. German, neither is German. So I wanted to concentrate on one thing, yeah. Yeah. be good at one thing because it is really hard to switch between languages professionally because you need to be really ready to answer practically any question coming from your students. Yes, yes. So yes. I do German, I teach German. And do you specialize in a particular level or a particular type of student or business German or everything? You get better as you go as a teacher too. You learn, you, you work out your own style. You get to understand who you like working with. I work pretty much with anyone from A1 to C1. I love working with beginners too. I thought it's boring at the beginning. 
Um, I don't see it that way. I think it's really fun. And it's a skill to be able to teach people zero knowledge in a language when they're very tentative. Sometimes it's their first language. You just need to, you need to be a really good psychologist. You need to feel a person to have a lot of empathy uh, because, you know, I feel like a bit of responsibility because if I'm impatient or if I'm, if a person, you know, stops working with me, if a person is unhappy, maybe they will never come back and will just not believe in themselves. So it's very important to, uh, to give that, to give that feeling that you can do it. You can do it. I've done it. My students do it. Everybody does it. You can do it too. Yeah, so if the yeah. people, if people stay, if they go beyond that phase as a beginner, because in Germany it's tricky, it, it, it gets hard pretty much from the beginning as opposed to Spanish or Italian. So that is fun. But also working with advanced students is very interesting because uh, they ask tricky questions. You have to think a lot because it's not my native language, right? So I need to think. There is a lot of mental work for me uh, working with all of my students, but mostly with advanced students. They ask tricky questions. Sometimes you have to analyze together. Um, so it's really challenging in a, in a good way. Many people for German um, want to take exams, right? People want to take exams because they need them for work, to get a passport, to get a nationality, to be able to study at university. This is a huge business for German teachers. So if you can do that, if you know how exams work, how exam preparation works, this is a great niche. So I, I have experience in exams, so I can do that. I love doing that too. And so you now work through your website mainly. If somebody wants to book some lessons with you, should they use italki or should they be going to your website now? Uh, where are you to be found? Both. I'm on italki and out of italki. Of course, italki takes 15% of the money you earn, which is not cool. But I work with italki too because it's a huge market and you can get clients. I work outside of italki as well. Um, I do both, I would say, 50-50. Yeah. Yeah. And you also offer a mentoring uh, program as well. Uh, could you explain a little bit about what that is? Mentoring is basically, um, the, the idea uh, behind mentoring is that anybody can learn a language, right? We do not need teachers. We do not need uh, people to explain explain as grammar rules because we can find all that information online in, in the books. Uh, we look good enough, but what sometimes people need is motivation, accountability, somebody to be able to share with, to have somebody who, who cares, right, that will not let you uh, give up. And um, this, is, this is the idea behind uh, language mentoring. Um, this could mean uh, weekly um, meetings on Skype. Uh, where people will tell me what they're working on, how they're doing. Um, if it's about languages I speak, I very often can can help to write so they can pose, they can ask questions related to uh, grammar, vocabulary or whatnot. But I would definitely say that the way I'm teaching uh, also includes, also involves partly mentoring and coaching it's not just the teaching. It's not like the teacher, you know, from the eighties or I don't know, the guy who comes and tells these are the rules, please learn until next time. No, it never is. Now, if you want to be a good, a good teacher or coach or mentor, you need to do all of those things. You need to be a psychologist. You need to feel a person. You need to realize where they are. Sometimes you need to support. Sometimes you need to be strict. It's, it's human communication. So it definitely involves everything. And the website name is, what's the address? Uh, AlexFalaza.com. That's easy to remember. <laughs> I'll put a link, folks, underneath, the, uh, underneath this video. So, Alex, we're almost out of time. Uh, I must ask you, though, OK, you're focusing this year on Italian and French, but you've now got to 10 languages. Is that it? Or do you think you might find yourself doing more languages in the future? Uh, which ones? That's a good one. Um, I definitely believe I will continue. 
I want to bring that mission to an end because I feel it's worth it's worth finishing, it's worth seeing it through. There are definitely languages I would like to learn just for fun without setting that goal of taking an exam, getting to a C1 level. There are many languages that sound enticing, like um, uh, Scandinavian languages, Norwegian, Danish, Swedish. I definitely want to learn at least one of them, which would mean I can understand other other twos, other two. I would definitely learn want to um, improve my Croatian, Serbian, Bosnian. Right, the Slavic languages are so much fun. As you speak Russian, you can connect probably. If you know one, it's easier to learn another one. I now understand. I think I would say four. Uh, so I definitely want to do that. Romanian is extremely interesting because I already speak other Romance languages. So bit by bit, I was thinking recently I could do one language a year, maybe after after finishing those ten and see where it goes. It's, it's just fun. You can just do it for fun. <laughs> well, it's certainly <laughs> been fun talking to you today, Alex. And Thanks. there's so much wisdom there and inspiration. I'm sure, folks, you'll all have taken something from this great conversation. So, everyone at home, thanks a lot for being with me this time. Alex, thank you very much for uh, being with us here on the channel. I hope you'll come back and talk to me about your use of exams uh, in another video uh, as a tool for language learning. It's not something nice. we didn't have time for today. But for now, thank you very much and see you all at home next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.